This is episode 163 of Stand Up. Join me today, Dr. Cynthia Idris Miller of American University on far right extremism and her new book about it, and my friend Kelly Carlin on how to live your best life during the pandemic. Hi, I'm Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Hey guys, welcome to the show. I have a new idea for what my goal should be for each episode, which is I hear from so many different people on what they like and what they don't like. And a lot of you really like just a laid back or interesting, thoughtful conversation with a smart, thoughtful person about life. And a lot of you, of course, like the smart academics and scholars and policy expert that I talk to as well. So I feel like an ideal show has one of each, a conversation with one of each of those type of people. And I can't say that I'm going to be able to do that every episode, but I kind of want to. What do you think of that? Also, how do we continue to build this community online? What are your ideas for platforms that I should be using? A lot of you emailed me your answers to that. And if you've got more ideas, and I'll get back to them as I start to organize all of this, then email me at standupwithpete at gmail.com and include the subject, the stand-up community in the subject. And I'll put that in a folder and get back to all of you when I am done building the studio, the Shedio. And it is coming along. I got the floor down this morning, and it was like 95 degrees, so hot, so humid in the Northeast. But I got a lot of work done today on the Shedio, and I still had time somehow to have two great guests on the show as well. Want to thank new subscribers, uh, including two folks that subscribed today with $25 subscriptions. Wow. Ryan Apperson just became a $25 patron. Ryan, thank you very much. That's amazing. So glad to have you as part of the community. And also, Chris Chester. Hey, Chris. Chris is now a $25 patron as well, which is so exciting. And Nick Martin is a $5 patron. Got those three subscriptions today and really so happy. Nick wrote me a message on Patreon as well as many of you do when you subscribe saying, Pete, thanks for your work. Enjoy the hell out of the show. I've listened to you since the serious days. I canceled my subscription when you left. I enjoy your views on masculinity, parenting, politics, and your overall curiosity and insight. You've been there through some really dark times in my life, and your voice has helped me tremendously through the years. Best wishes and keep up the good work. Nick, thank you very much. Thank all of you who are subscribing and supporting the show. Cannot do it without you. Five days a week. Whoo! Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic and sign up now if you haven't already, and I'll give you a shout out here on the show. Day 1298 of our long national nightmare, 83 days until... Election Day, November 3rd, 2020. I hope you're registered. I hope you are going to mail in and prepare to vote however you're going to vote early. And there's all kinds of other things you can do as well. So let me know what you're doing, if you're doing anything to get ready for this life-changing, crucial election. Is America over? Well, it will be. If Trump gets reelected, that's my prediction, at least, whatever that means. Uh, There's a great article in the Rolling Stone about that, by the way. Apparently, a White House aide reached out to uh, South Dakota last year about the process for adding Trump's face to Mount Rushmore. Can that possibly be be true? Is that just a distraction that they put out? Can you imagine Trump's awful face on the side of a mountain Oh, permanently? No, I don't think so. Uh, at least 97,000 children in the U.S. have tested positive for COVID-19 during the last two weeks of July alone. And we want to send our kids back to school. I mean, in some areas, I think it's probably feasible if it's done really carefully, but obviously in other areas, uh, definitely not. Five million Americans have contracted the COVID-19 virus, and I hope that we can all continue to do our best to not get it. I know I'm doing my best. My BFF, my friend David Campbell, as I call him Campbell, in Australia, made a sobering point to me today on the Marco Polo app where we communicate And he said, it's going to be a COVID Christmas. I mean, he didn't sing it, even though he's a singer, but I just did. Yeah, we're going to be in this for the long haul. And thinking about the holidays is not something I want to do here in mid-August. But yeah, a COVID Christmas, I I think it's pretty fair to say. 
Today, the president had uh, another one of his stupid press conferences. He was rushed out of the briefing room and there were shots fired outside the White House, which made for a pretty exciting briefing. He came back a, a short while later, continued to lie his face off about the pandemic, bragging that he's done such a good job. And had he not done certain things, it would have been way worse. Then he said that a pandemic of the pandemic of 1917 ended World War II, which it most certainly did not. In 1917, they say, right, the, the great the great pandemic certainly was a terrible thing where they lost anywhere from 50 to 100 million people. Probably ended the Second World War. All the soldiers were sick. Uh, it was a that was a uh, terrible situation. Also, the pandemic happened in 1918, not 1917, and 37 million people died in World War One, not 50 to 100 million, like he said. Oh, and the Second World War ended in 1945, not in 1917. Yet in 2015, you know, uh, President Trump, now President Trump, then just asshole Trump went after Hillary Clinton for her husband. Bill's assaults and transgressions against women, even though Trump himself had assaulted over a dozen women and probably far more. And now he's going after his opponent's cognitive uh, abilities when he can barely pronounce words, doesn't know what year anything happened and can't remember yesterday. I love how Trump supporters make fun of Joe Biden's mental acuity. In the meantime, the president can't even pronounce the word Yosemite. Also uh, making fun of this, my friend and former writer at the Colbert Report, Frank Lesser, tweeted that uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who was defending Trump last week for pronouncing Thailand, Thailand, he will probably come out and defend Trump by saying, yes, you elitist provincials laugh. Trump isn't referencing the 1918 Spanish flu, but the 1917 Portuguese grip, which infected a young Hitler after incubating 28 years. It suddenly became symptomatic in the bunker and he sneezed so violently it blew his brains out. <laughs> Frank Lesser, very funny. Speaking of funny comedy, writers Brian Tucker tweaky, tweeting at B Tucker Time tweeted, In New Zealand, a million kids will be going back to school. In America, a thousand bikers got to see a Smash Mouth in concert. <laughs> Sturgis. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to go really well for them. And finally, before we get to my first guest, several of you sent me this article, which is so good from Slate.com, titled The Trump Pandemic, a blow-by-blow -blow account of how the president killed thousands of Americans by William Salatin, who is great. I just wanted to read a little bit of it for you and highly recommend it. I'll share it in the show notes as well. On July 17th, President Donald Trump said for a Fox News interview at the White House, at the time, nearly 140,000 Americans were dead from the novel coronavirus. The interviewer, Chris Wallace, showed Trump a video clip in which Robert Redfield, the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, warned of a difficult fall and winter ahead. Trump dismissed the warning. He scoffed at the experts that misjudged the virus all along. Everybody thought this summer it would go away, said Trump. They used to say the heat, the heat was good for it and it really knocks it out, remember? So they got that one wrong. Well, Trump's account was completely backward. Redfield and other U.S. public health officials had never promised that heat would knock out the virus. In fact, they had cautioned against that assumption. The person who had held out the false promise of warm weather reprieve again and again was Trump. And he hadn't gotten the idea from any of his medical advisors. He'd gotten it, guess from who? Xi Jinping, the president of China, in a phone call in February. Yeah, the phone call, the talking points Trump picked up from it, and his subsequent attempts to cover up his alliance with Xi are part of a deep portray betrayal. The story the president now tells that he built the greatest economy in history, that China blindsided him by unleashing the virus, and that Trump saved millions of lives by mobilizing America to defeat it is a lie. Trump collaborated with Xi concealed the threat, impeded the U.S.'s government's response, silenced those who sought to warn the public, and pushed states to take risks that escalated the tragedy. He's personally responsible for tens of thousands of deaths. This isn't speculation. All the evidence is on the public record. But the truth, 
unlike Trump's false narrative, is scattered in different places. It's in emails, leaks, interviews, hearings, scientific reports, and the president's stray remarks. This article puts those fragments together. It documents Trump's interference or negligence in every stage of the government's failure. Preparation, mobilization, public communication, testing, mitigation, and reopening. There you go. Definitely check that article out. Slate.com. William William Salatin, and I will link to it in the show notes for this episode. Okay, well, let me get to my first guest. Shall we get this started? I got to just, I, I, you know, I never know how you listen to this podcast. If you, I always want to put out as much content as I can, different types of guests, five days a week. So there'll always be something there that hopefully you'll really like and want to listen to. I don't know if you look at the lineup and say, oh, I like this person, I like that person, but you're really going to want to hear my conversation with Kelly Carlin, which is coming up. We had a fascinating, uh, inspiring, very thought-provoking conversation. She's so smart, and I just love Kelly. That is coming up, but first, my first guest is a first-timer here on the show. She's an expert on far-right extremism. She's a professor of education and sociology at American University. She runs the Polarization and Extreme Research and Innovation Lab there. She's written several books, including The Extreme Gone Mainstream, Commercialization and Far-Right Youth Culture in Germany. But her new book that we talked about today is called Hate in the Homeland, The New Global Far-Right. comes out in October of this year. You can follow her on Twitter at Miller Idris. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Cynthia Miller Idris. Very happy to have you joining me as uh, challenging and terrifying as your work is. The new book is excellent. And here's the thing about your work or specifically this new book. You offer a lot of ideas and solutions to these very serious problems, which I think sets you apart to some extent. So uh, that's great, right? I mean, there are solutions that that you have here in the book. I hope so. I hope those are solutions. I have ideas anyway. We'll, yeah. we'll find out. I think we should test them and find out if they work. For, but, sh- um, for sure. Hopefully these are some ideas that might might shed some light on what we could do differently. So you've been studying the far right extremism for about 20 years. Is that right? Yeah, for 20 years. I mean, and I would say for 17 of that or so, uh, even even I myself thought of myself as a scholar of fringe subcultures. Um, and then that changed. And uh, I became, you know, uh, uh, the work became much more relevant to the mainstream, I would say. Meaning because it's no longer fringe subcultures, it's more mainstream <laughs> and, and, and more widely accepted. <laughs> Yeah, it became more mainstream, became more normalized here and also in the States. I mean, I had been working in Europe for for 20 years, for the most part, looking at um, school based responses to extremism in Germany and specifically how German schools grapple with resurgent waves of far right extremism. and, And they have a whole infrastructure and lots of ways to do that. That um, that we haven't really developed in the states, and so you know, I really was an area studies scholar, is what we call ourselves in the in the in the U.S. So some, I was a German major as an undergrad. Um, Mm. You know, I really um, spent time in Germany, and that's sort of what I did, and reported on that um, in the U.S. mostly to people who were interested in understanding the legacies of the Holocaust and in Germany, and and uh, what you do in in schools to respond to that, and then. you know, and then that kind of changed here in the States as we started to see a more public youth culture and the weaponization of youth culture by the far right. Some of the things that I learned in, in Europe became relevant here. Is there is there any way to kind of measure, um, quantify the rise of the far right? It, it feels like it. It feels like we should talk about it kind of how you've studied it in terms of regionally and, and not globally. But I also feel that watching the extremism gain ground has been a, a, sadly a global phenomenon from New Zealand, of course, with Christchurch to Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and of course, uh, what we're seeing in, in the U.S. H- how do you measure the growth of an idea, a pernicious, dangerous, horrible one like this? Yeah, I think, you know, the way I usually uh, talk about this is, unfortunately, essentially on every measure we have available, um, plots foiled by the FBI, the, you know, rise of white supremacist extremist propaganda, paper flyers on college campuses, um, 
actual terror attacks globally, the numbers of deaths. I mean, essentially every measure you can come up with, we've seen the numbers of hate groups, right? We've seen increases, um, or, you know, steady kind of rise, sometimes less of a steep curve. So one year it might be only 7% of rise of propaganda, but then it goes back up. Um, and those are, you know, it doesn't matter who's doing the counting. So you have watchdog groups who document that, but also the FBI is documenting that. And so I think, um, you know, those numbers might vary depending on whether these are self-reported things to watchdog groups or, or uh, FBI reports, but they all show increases. And I think uh, we've seen that in testimony before Congress, multiple hearings, you know, documenting that that these things have have gone up and they've gone up in the U.S. and they've gone up globally. So, um, you know, the 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 easy thing to say is that, like, there's no question on the data. Um, I think the bigger questions are why and what do we do about it? Yeah. So let's uh, identify who the far right is. The beginning of your new book, Hate in the Homeland, you say, what is the far right? You answer that question. It's a big question. There's there's and it, it really kind of if it wasn't so dangerous and scary, it, w- it would simply be fascinating. I can understand why you're interested in this work and, and why it's so fascinating for, for me to read and, and 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 anybody to study. But what how how do we define the far right extremists? So when I talk about the far right, I'm including um, both what we call the radical right and what we call the extreme right. But mostly I focus on the extreme right, which are the fringe outside of the realm of, you know, what anyone would would say is the realm of acceptable democratic kind of behavior. Um, These are groups that are deliberately anti-democratic. They are undermining minority rights, undermining freedoms of the press, of religion, um, they are promoting authoritarianism, um, and they're also valorizing violence as a not just as a an acceptable means to an end, but as a moral and heroic action intended to bring about their end goals, which is you know restored white civilization. Let's say so. I, I think one thing that's important to understand is that there's a spectrum. Um, so the far right is it's an imperfect term. I sometimes call it the best bad term. Um, for the phenomenon. I don't even love the term, that, but there's no great term to capture the whole right, spectrum. Right. So we're talking about anti-government groups, seditionists, conspirational seditionists, but also white supremacist, neo-Nazi um, kind of, uh, you know, extremists who are motivated by race. And so there's, there's a wide range, um, but they share a kind of anti-democratic and in some cases, apocalyptic um, scenarios about the end times, whether that's race war or civil war and the desire to bring down systems that exist today. I feel like so often we're, we're thinking of white nationalism, white supremacy, um, ethnocentrism, ethnostates is the goal. But I but you also write about a, a gender issue. And in, in the U.S. and well, around the world, you've seen the, the rise, the growth of what's called incels, which is. Well, you can you can uh, define and describe that. Where do they fall in and, and fit in with the extreme right? I think the, uh, the the incel movements and also just in general, what we would call male supremacist movements. So incels are involuntary celibates, um, people who believe men who believe that they are you know left out of um sexual relationships with women that they will that they are um, deliberately left behind and that they're entitled to those relationships they sometimes advocate um for rape or advocate for um uh, you know uh forcible encounters sexual encounters and male supremacist movements which believe that that they that men are superior to women and and um, that women ought to be in their rightful place as kind of second class citizens. Those kinds of misogynistic male supremacist movements are part of the far right spectrum. They don't always completely overlap, but they often do in ways that I think it's been harder for. Um, it's taken some time for I think authorities even to recognize those intersections and to understand the way that toxic online communities often intersect across male supremacist and white supremacist spaces. Yeah, you said uh, toxic online communities. And I think that's the the key to all of this now or to the, the, the rapid growth that we've seen of these ideas, of course, is online communities. There are harmless, amazing online communities that 
we gather around anything from gardening to Star Trek to anything you want. But unfortunately, it's so easy to find like minded people. You can also find like minded people that are extremists on the issues that we're talking about here. How has the Internet and social media changed what was always there, but was more of a fringe movement? And you'd have to gather in, you know, some some secret place or, you know, if for Al Qaeda uh, uh, extremists, you could, you know, the same thing. We they, they gathered in Afghanistan to plot the 9-11. But now you just have to be online. You just need an Internet connection. And that's it. How has that changed this situation? I think it's changed it in a whole lot of ways. I mean, on the one hand, you have, um, you know, obviously it's just much easier to communicate and to find people. You don't have to just go to a you know, some kind of backwoods militia gathering or a hard rock concert that is intimidating, let's say, even for somebody who is going to go there for the first time. This isn't relegated to, you know, a a group of violent, ignorant thugs in the woods. Um, It can be a, a YouTube cooking show that's introducing kind of organic food recipes at the same time as it's weaving in ideas about the purity of race and and the way to raise white babies, you know, and kind of softer language to women. And so one of the things that we see is it it broadens the spectrum. And I think, uh, you know, that disrupts what a lot of Americans or or others, uh, you know, hold in their heads about who a white supremacist or who a far right extremist is and, and what they should want to do or, or do with their time. And I, I think the what extremists have realized is, you know, that people have lots of different interests and hobbies and there are ways to reach them wherever they are, um, including, you know, whether that's at a farmer's market or in a cooking show or um, in a mixed martial arts gym, you know, or whatever that is on a college campus, you find people where they are and then kind of recruit them in. And I think that's one of the ways that general hobbies and culture have kind of been weaponized or, you know, reached out to by the far right in online spaces um, that has taken policymakers and practitioners a lot more time to catch on to. What is this cooking show thread that we're talking about? I mean, I, like if, if, if when you say that and, and you, this is to me one of the most interesting parts about your new book, which is delving into all the online communications and how it works and where people meet. But when you say, you know, cooking show, it's like, man, you start with something com- completely uh, uh, common and, uh, you know, innocent and interesting that anybody would be interested in. I, I've I've fallen into some of those like I was watching a guy. I'm trying to learn to put some drywall up and I went on YouTube and I found this guy and he was awesome. And then one thing led to another and he's like a homesteader and he's a prepper and come to find out he's kind of an extremist. So I'm like, wow, well, yeah. the guy's pretty good at drywall. That's a perfect example of a gateway, right? So I think this is this is what I mean by, you know, there's a lot of intersections. I mean, a lot of what we're seeing are overlaps and intersections between extreme preppers, conspiracy theorists homesteaders, homeschoolers, right? People who are retreating away from systems, wanting to prepare for something, fear of something apocalyptic coming. And those things both on the one hand, you know, they maybe are trying to broaden their own markets and create more mainstream types of things to tell people about drywall or cooking or whatever, but also maybe as a gateway kind of gradually draw people in if they're deliberately trying to recruit. It is a, it is a, a method to kind of get that word out and to, and to spread. And, but on the other hand, one of the things we've learned is that the way that algorithms work and recommendation systems work online, you know, if you go on Amazon and you buy something you know, it tells you sometimes what other people bought. People who looked at this looked at this, right? And the same thing happens when you look at a video or you search for stuff online, you get recommended other things. Um, You get a list of videos to watch. And one of the things that has happened is that people can get drawn into because of the habits that other people have online, you know, you can get drawn into viewing other content that leads you further and further down a kind of pipeline of ever more extreme material. Is um, Yeah. Is there any way to measure like how often someone, cause I've heard it, it, sometimes it seems to start from nothing with someone doesn't have impulses. They haven't had inexperience. It's just, they're online, they're lonely, they're looking things up and they fall into this 
versus somebody that's looking for other like minded extremists. How how often do these algorithms, whether it be YouTube or or some of the deeper, darker web stuff, the 4chan's, how, how often does someone fall into it kind of accidentally? Obviously, they're predisposed somehow. But 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 did they ever you know, sometimes you hear these families losing their son. Yeah. And they're like, where where did this come from? How did he find this stuff? And it's not necessarily someone at school. It's someone on YouTube. Yeah, I think, you know, the so there's a lot there's a lot in that question. So I want to unpack a couple parts of it. So one is that I think um, I think that people stumble on this stuff. I think that's a way to think about it. They stumble on it when they're looking for things. So I think it's unlikely that someone's going to find it if they're not looking for something. But th- what that something is has broadened. So you're not just searching for white supremacist extremism, right? Maybe you're searching about depression or about isolation or um, prepping, right? So you're, I, I, I give an example in the book of someone told me they were looking up Tupperware, you know, pre- how to prep something in a Tupperware and it led them to a prepping site, right? So you're searching for something. It might land you accidentally in the wrong information, or maybe it lands you into something that becomes a gateway. I think it's a misnomer to think of this as a rabbit hole that people s- fall down into and can't get out. I think it's it's more accurate to think of it as a series of choices that people make. And there's some kind of interaction between the choices that they're making in real time, in their life, they have some autonomy. They are not just, you know, dupes that are sucked into into some rabbit hole, but that the recommendation systems do prompt them with a selection of choices that that then can 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 take them down a pathway. And the further you go down that pathway, the harder it is, I think, to come back. And that's where you start seeing these parents say, you know, what happened? Like, the, you know, my kid was gaming and all of a sudden, yeah. you know, they're they 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 go follow some other URL that somebody recommends and they land on this other so it, other pathway and and I think it's the many more openings to encounter bad actors online to encounter propaganda online and to be recommended more salacious and more extreme content because of the way those algorithms you know work that that can lead more people down those pathways and I will say right now with seventy million. <laughs> kids at home online yeah the learning online this is a real concern it's you know i'm you know i try not to be too alarmist i hope i didn't come across in the book as too too alarmist but i'm i am more nervous now um about what's happening with the number of people online all the time than you know than i have been in the past i think it's just a perfect storm of you know a lot of time online a ton of isolation people depressed and anxious looking for explanations and then you know, that material's out there. My my understanding is that there's there's no good data that says very violent, realistically violent video games make people, especially adolescents, kids, violent. Uh, uh, as easy as that might be for some people to believe, there's no data that says you play a violent video game and then you go out and shoot somebody. I, I think it's most evident uh, in a place like Japan where they play a lot more uh, violent video games, but yet they're not more violent. However, you just touched on this. These games now are are played with complete strangers and anonymity. And so do you have examples and is there research where someone was radicalized or went down the path because they were playing, I don't know, a, a video game like Call of Duty and 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 somebody living somewhere else was in their ears and one thing leads to another and they've been recruited. Yeah. So I think what you're seeing today, I agree, I think it's not as much that the video games themselves are violent as it is that the way that video games are played today are on platforms that come with them, you know, that, that are accompanied by all kinds of possibilities for engaging in real time with other human beings who are out there. And so there's chat, there's forums and servers and ways to, to communicate with people while you're gaming that make them ripe, you know, ripe spaces for, um, for, deliberate recruitment or deliberate extremist content sharing, as well as kind of coincidental meeting bad actors. And so uh, the Anti-Defamation League had a survey last year or the year before that said that that found that 23 percent of gamers um, encounter discussions that involve white supremacist extremist content while they're gaming. So about a quarter of gamers are running into this content out there. So yeah, I've never played any of those games, but like my daughter was playing Fortnite, and I heard this kid throwing the N word around, and I'm I I hear that like the N word and 
and the F word, not fuck, but the anti-gay one are, are like super common uh, being thrown out. And they're probably mostly, you know, quote, harmless in terms of people aren't acting on them. But but that kind of stuff being thrown out there so uh, often is 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 terrifying. Yeah, I think there's different categories. So I think you have like racist and misogynistic content that's dehumanizing, right? That right. desensitizes. And then you have kind of actual servers or discussion boards or forums or things that are going on where people are really um, sharing conspirational content, kind of trying to red pill other people, trying to wake them up, trying to get them to realize that there's some kind of conspiracy out there, whether that's a great replacement, you know, which is a conspiracy that's mobilized and motivated um, terrorists in Christchurch and El Paso or some other idea that there's orchestrated efforts out there, vaccine conspiracies, other kinds of conspiracies. Um, and then, and then there's deliberate recruitment efforts. There are people out there actually trying to, you know, find young people to groom and get them, get them engaged and there's give them a URL, bring them up, bring them over to another place and, and, you know, another website, another server and uh, an encrypted space and get them to engage. And we know that from, um, from folks who do do radicalization work, when they've talked with formers who've left the scene, they've right. basically explained that this was something that they did. Well, it feels like there's not enough, unfortunately, formers for people, experts like you to study and talk to. I, I know you, uh, I saw uh, in my prep to interview you, you were on a panel with Chris, Christian Piccolini uh, um, and, and good for him, but he's in high demand because there aren't many formers and even him, like he got into this, like, I feel like in the nineties when things were different, it, it I mean, are there a lot of people for you to talk to that have been radicalized and then left that world in the last few years when everything has started to really pick up? I mean, there are a handful of folks out there who, you know, I mean, so there there are lots of great formers who are out there who who are constantly speaking, often paired with me in in conversations. Um, we have a former working in our lab full time. We have had formers work consult for us um, in the research lab when we need advice on um, whatever it is on, on, on the content. And, and so I would say I'm in contact with a lot of formers who are fantastic. Um, but I think it's true that a lot of people who come out of these movements, um, it, you know, it's a long process. It takes a long time to come out. It's, it's like ideological brainwashing of, of any other, you know, kind, you have to figure out how to come out of that, how to get the emotional support you need and uh, not everybody's, you know, ready to be public or publicly engaged in this stuff uh, right away, nor should they be. What are the, the world circumstances that people either point to or don't that have led to some extent to radicalization? Cause I think about the nine 11 attacks uh, and the anti-Muslim sentiment here and around the world. I think about the election of a black man in America and I think about the European migration of uh, brown skin folks from anywhere from Syria, the Middle East into Europe. And and the idea that uh, I, I mean, I think the data shows that white Western Europeans are not reproducing at the type of rates that uh, brown Muslims may be, for lack of a, a better terminology that you may correct. What are what are the other kind of are those uh, some of the catalysts? Um, how much weight do the, they carry? And, and, and what are the other things that these radical extremists point to as to what they're so concerned about? So, I, th- you know, how did I do muddling through that, by the way? Was that good. was that there was anything? Good. Yeah, that was okay. no, really good. Really good uh, <laughs> question. Um, the you know, what you see is that it almost doesn't matter what the issue is. Of course it does matter, but the issue itself matters less than the framing and the way that the issue can be manipulated. So demographic change is a huge one um, that gets manipulated and gets framed as a great replacement. That is a conspirational, uh, the idea that there's an orchestrated replacement of white people by multicultural, with, with multicultural societies, that that's deliberate, that it's to reduce the power that white people hold. But you know, both the Christchurch and the El Paso terrorists cited environmental issues as part of their motivation, arguing that, you know, climate change means that we have to protect, white people have to protect the space that we have and reduce immigration. So really, I've never heard that. There's extremists pointing to climate change. I mean, it's true that migration 
climate change will force migration. But it, it, yeah. it, 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 for people to make those connect those two dots right now would seem yeah, surprising. People call it the greening of hate or ecofascism. I mean, it's the idea is that um, so, you know, so in a way, what, I guess what I'm trying to say is it, it almost doesn't matter whether that's organic food, whether it's, um, you know, how are you, whether it's environmental change, is it demographic change? you know, change, I guess, would be the constant, right? That there's some kind of change and it's positioning that change as a threat and as a threat to white people. And in particular, in the case of white supremacist extremism. Now, in the case of anti-government extremism, it's, you know, government tyranny that's the threat that is, whether the change is gun control legislation or um, shelter in place orders or a vaccine that, people say is going to include, you know, some conspiracy about a tracking device being implanted in you, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of wild conspiracy theories batted about, but these, so maybe the constant is change in some way, but it's the positioning of that change as threatening to, in an existential way, in a way that, that is, you know, life or death, us or them, good versus evil, that must be overcome and and requires heroic action and the use of violence to to stave it off. Could you give me some specific examples of some of the horrific extremists who you've studied from? Uh, I don't really like to say their names, but uh, either, from, yeah. from the I don't know if you think that's effective or not. But I know a lot of victims' families don't like it. You know, you don't want to um, yeah. deify these people. But from I, you know the Charleston church shooter to the Christchurch New Zealand shooter are two that come to mind. Um, then some of these uh, in, in cells uh, like out in, in, in Southern California, there was one. Can you give me any examples of, of how these and it's always it's almost always men, right? I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, that unifies it. I mean, I think it's really important to to note that women's engagement is increasing. I mean, we do have evidence that both on this kind of softer side of recruiting and of uh, especially through social media and YouTube videos, but even in terrorists. Uh, well, there's in leaders terrorists. in France and Germany that are women, Marie Le Pen, political and I forget the German political parties. Exactly. So yeah. there's there are increasing roles of women in, in lots of different dimensions of this that that have to be acknowledged. But the violence is almost always perpetrated by men. And it is, uh, you know, it is um, the threat primarily comes from from men. So that is really important. Um, you know, there have been a number of, um, at the, on the terrorist fringe, a number of violent attacks that, um, and, you know, whether it's a Sikh temple or, a African-American church in Charleston, a mosque, um, in Christchurch, a Walmart in El Paso. I mean, these are, you know, a wide variety of targets, often religious institutions, but not always synagogues and mosques and churches and temples, but a Walmart, um, there are, you know, there are a wide variety of targets who all share being non-white, non-Christian, um, being different and being positioned as a threat, an existential threat. And I think, again, it's back to that idea of it's us versus them. And so much so that I think in each of these cases, the terrorists really believe that they are themselves moral actors, that they are doing the right thing and that what they're doing is, um, is required of them, um, to save their people, you know, to, uh, in order to, um, to take heroic action and inspire others to do the same. They really feel like this is, this is the end times coming. This is the only thing they can do. They're left with no choice and they have to do it. So it's a compulsion to act heroically to save their people. Yeah. You see, if you write about this in the book, the pizza gate guy. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's so sad that they yeah. think that they're going to be able to be the catalyst. And in some cases, I guess they are. I mean, I feel like, um, the Norwegian guy, one of the most horrific ones in, Nor in Norway, where, of course, you've spent a lot of time studying. Again, I don't want to say his name, but a fascinating, um, a terrifying story there. Uh, and I feel like, if I'm not mistaken, uh, maybe it was the Christchurch uh, uh, terrorist or or others that have a lot of them have referenced the Norwegian uh, terrorists manifesto. Maybe he yeah. was. So, in a, in a, so sometimes I, my point is, sometimes it does lead to. Uh, creating uh, other followers who commit violence and and sometimes yeah. um, hopefully like it does. I don't know if the Charleston church shooter did that kid seem like a, not such a an articulate uh, person. Um, but but how often do they inspire others? They definitely inspire uh, other actors, but also 
clusters of followers online. So, you know, even the Charleston church shooter has followers online who call themselves the bull patrol, you know, in reference to his haircut, like the bull, bull style haircut. Right. Uh, So it's, so there's, you know, there are followers, there are those who are inspired by who feel they would take action, um, you know, to support or to follow or to valorize in that way. And that's part of the intent of this is to terrorize local populations, but also to inspire and and supposedly wake up others. And I think that that's, you know, really important. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's important not to say their names. It's important to try to, you know, balance this line between um, exposure and valorization. Like, how do you, you know, uh, expose something and explain it without actually you know, giving it too much sunlight. And I think that's, it's a fine line. It's hard to walk. Uh, when I argue with people and and try to convince them, because they're not already convinced, generally speaking, that Donald Trump, our president, is a white nationalist or a white supremacist. The argument I, I, I think is the most effective is that self-avowed white supremacists and extremists like him and support him and vote for him. What is the data there? Am I wrong about that? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think early on there was um, support. There was strong support. There was a sense that this was an administration that was going to pursue the goals um, of of uh, the white extre- you know, white supremacist extremists to close borders, to um, deport people, right, to make it a white nation, uh, to support the goals, but. Um, in more recent years and more recent months, I think the extreme fringe has moved away from the administration has felt that it hasn't gone far enough. It hasn't achieved the goals that, that the dreams weren't realized. And so, um, you know, I don't know how that plays out politically with this election or how that plays out with, with violence in the long run. But I think the groups that I study and the fringes that I study are really anti-system regardless. So, on the extreme fringe, on the violent fringe, they are, um, you know, a- against anything in the mainstream that hasn't has hasn't gone far enough. What is your view? I'm really curious, and I'm not sure if you cover this in the book. I'm not through it yet, uh, but it's fascinating and so important, uh, and everybody should get it. Hate in the homeland, the du- the new global far right. Professor Cynthia Miller Idris is my guest. Uh, what is your view? Because you'd spent so much time working, living, and studying Germany. On on the idea, because I want to turn to solutions here if we have time, uh, hopefully the idea that in Germany, you can explain it better to me, but it's it's against the law to fly the Nazi flag, to have a swastika uh, exposed. Um, and that, of course, is not illegal in the United States of America. In America, we have freedom of speech. Obviously, it's complicated and, you know, government offices and buildings and what we define as as hate speech or or symbolisms of hate. but I've I've talked to I think it was Nadine Straussen who uh, who who used to head the ACLU where she says that that law in Germany hasn't actually done uh, it's it's well intentioned but it hasn't worked and we see the rise of some really disconcerting news coming out of Germany recently of of the right in that country D- does it work to ban hate speech Yeah great question my view on this is that it doesn't work if what you're trying to do is affect the far right itself, but it is an effective strategy at telling everybody else what's acceptable and not. Right. Creates norms, but. Right, exactly. But it definitely, not only does it not work, but it probably backfires. And, you know, I would, I would not dream to tell anybody in Germany how to deal with the history or, you know, what do you, I, I think it's, it's hard to imagine a post Holocaust Germany where you could fly the swastika or walk around and give the Heil Hitler salute. Like these things are just completely taboo and it's a completely different history and society. And and the U S is different in that regard. And I think, um, you know, so I understand that, but what I will say is that the, the banning itself is part of what launched the game playing culture that I studied in my last book, which was called the extreme gone mainstream, which was about the kind of coding and iconography and the subtle mainstreaming of symbols that allowed people to get around those bands. And so, you know, even the number 88, which one school banned because it's the eighth letter of the alphabet and you can't display the eighth letter of the alphabet is HH for Heil Hitler. And so 
they banned the number 88 and kids started wearing t-shirts that said 100 minus 12 or 87 plus one, you know, like it's a constant right, game playing culture. You just change the formula, you, you know, modify the, you modify the code. You And it's and that fun. makes it harder for people like you and watchdog groups to keep up. It makes it harder to keep up, but it also, I think gives kids doing it, young people, a sense of power, a sense of secrecy. Oh, right. It's right. It's like, you're getting one over on adults. The same reason, you know, we have binge drinking in the States with our drinking, right? Like it's something that's banned, makes it taboo. It makes sure. it more desirable. And so I think that's a banning, great example. Drinking. You say, yeah. yeah, it's against the law. Don't do it. It'll kill you. And uh, people, do, we all do it. You know, it becomes a space, right? It becomes a space for rebellion, right? It right, becomes a space right. to rebel, to break taboos, to um, say "f you" to your parents, to mainstream society, whatever it is. And so, you know, that's what happens in Germany. I think here, by allowing it, that gives it a little bit more. You know, you can make it socially taboo, attach stigma to it. Um, you can't quite ban it in the same way. But I think where we sometimes make mistakes in institutions here is. By thinking that because you have to protect free speech, you can't also condemn hate speech. And I think that's a mistake. So I think that like what schools can do, what universities can do when they see white, you know, there was a good example of uh, several years ago, a, f a few years ago, a flyer, a white supremacist flyer on a university campus in Texas somewhere. And, and uh, after they found it, the university found it, they issued a statement that said, you know, this was um, removed because it violated the university policy on no adhesives on buildings, right? Like, all right. And so people huh. were like, what? You know, like, isn't there, aren't you going to say anything about the content? And so there was some protests. And finally, they came out and said, you know, and issued a second statement that said, oh, and this also goes against, you know, our values and our principles and what we stand for. But, you know, the damage was done at that point, right? And so I think, you know, I think what universities have gotten better at doing, so I spend a lot of my time in universities is saying, oh, a swastika stamped in the snow, you know, on campus, this is allowed. And it's also abhorrent, right? It goes against everything we believe as an institution, as a culture, as a community, we stand with our Jewish students and friends and faculty, you know, but it's allowed, right? And we understand that that's protected free speech. And I, I think that's a tension that, um, that institutions have to get better at. It's not something all of society can do, but a school can do it, a stadium can do it, a restaurant can do it, you know, to say we have we have standards and and we have values as a as a community that we um that we stand up for, even if we believe that person should be allowed to have, you know, hate speech tattooed on his forehead. What are some other solutions that you explore, whether they be policy solutions or change in cultures and norm or even just kind of support groups and, and, and creating, I think, I think a lot of what you find are young lost men that are looking yeah. for a, a group, just a group of people to be with. And too often they end up with these groups that are, that are, I mean, you hear this all the time with, as you call them, the formers, but what are some of these solutions that you think that you think work? Because it seems like it's a very hard thing to legislate. Yeah. Yeah. I think legislation is, I, I think top-down solutions in general are, um, are not, I mean, there are things that, that governments should be doing. They should be providing funding. They should support local communities. They need to connect people um, with the right kind of expertise when they need it. But really this is a, not just even a local government solution, but a really local community solution. Mm -hmm. So I think schools, mixed martial arts gyms, you know, campuses, um, you know, places that are affected where they're, wherever young people are, right, basically, wherever they hang out, chances are there's a chance at some point they're going to encounter something and, you know, there, or there's, and there are some places that are more vulnerable than others to encountering that kind of stuff that we know that I talk about in the book. Um, and I think working with adults in those spaces to better recognize some of the risks, recognize the rhetoric. So if you hear kids saying, you know, something like a, a terrible meme about the Holocaust, you know, you hear somebody saying that and then, you know, they say, oh, it's just a joke. Everybody says it. 
well, how do you react to that, right? Adults need training for this too. A lot of adults don't even understand what a meme is, right? How do you, how right, do you address yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah. When they, when the when your fourteen year olds explaining that red this pilled, is like, you mentioned earlier. There's a lot right. of different things that that I'm learning about. Yeah, right. That people won't necessarily understand, and so I think you know, working with understanding that this isn't just like a kid in a dark corner of a bedroom online all the time, but it's they're confronting it in particular kinds of places and spaces. And that if you understand where those risk, where those risks are, you can also work with adults. So working with teachers, we did a, we released a guide for parents and caregivers because they're on the front lines right now. Like here's some warning signs to look out for. If you hear your kid talking about conspiracy theories or talking about snowflakes who can't take a joke after they say something, Mm. you know, that is really offensive the chances are they've been exposed, right? If you hear these kinds of things, like at least you know they're encountering it and you can start conversations with them. But if you don't even recognize the language or don't even recognize some of the some of the ways that they communicate, it's harder to know where to begin. Parents, educators, local community leaders, being able to recognize how young people are are being exposed and 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 uh, and combat it that way. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, well, on the one hand, it's recognizing the risks, but then I think getting back to some of the stuff that you were saying too, it's understanding that there's also resiliency, right? And so there are ways to, um, you know, people are attracted to this because they're looking for a sense of purpose. They're looking for a way to enact meaning. They're isolated. They feel that people are off of them, brotherhood, belonging, a sense of togetherness, some sense of purpose. And so I think there are ways to strengthen identity and and also help young people recognize what online manipulation and propaganda looks like so that they kind of are more inoculated against it when they encounter it so some of its media literacy and better understanding hey you know when this when you see this kind of thing this is what's going on here somebody they're not really being honest with you or they're trying to manipulate you media literacy is a a really important one um all right so final uh, question about all of this really and it would seem that uh, the worst case scenario is someone committing violence. And when you saw what happened in New Zealand, this guy had a, a certain kind of gun. He was able to kill a lot of people. You've obviously seen that happen over and over in the U.S. Do you think that there are uh, policy solutions that are not only gun control, but kind of weapon control? There are bomb making, you know, uh, directions online and so on. Do you see any any solutions there to Uh, make it harder for certain types of people to get their hands on dangerous weapons, guns, bombs, explosives, et cetera. Because, I mean, I think it probably I don't know where you start, but if you started with Timothy McVeigh, that was fertilizer in a truck. I mean, whatever it is. It's a great point. I mean, I think that that is a really good example of how where policies can matter. Right. So there are laws and there are policies that can matter. And one is you know, trying to make sure that we have a better understanding of, of, and, and can prevent, you know, people getting their hands on weapons that can cause mass harm, um, that there's better background checks, that it's harder for them to get them, that laws are being upheld that exist, right? That people are not getting around laws and buying things illegally. Um, and or if there they, was just some way to cross reference that a kid is 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 looking into the, this thing and that thing, and he's he's gone down this rabbit hole. Um, yeah, guess what? You don't get an AR-15, buddy. I'm sorry. You you know you're in the Boogaloo movement. You're in the the Proud Boys movement. You've been flagged. You can't have a gun. And also, we're gonna make sure that you don't buy ingredients for a bomb or something. I know that was very difficult to do, but we we I think there's got to be solutions there. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, I think, and you know, one of the things I I. Uh, would really like to see develop in the States. In Germany, they have a system across the country called, they're basically called mobile advisors. And it's kind of like, you know, every town, every community, every county has these, it's a little office, a couple of people, a website. So if anybody has a question, right, a kid in class sees something, it might be a little off, a colleague, a parent, you know, a teacher, somebody is worried about somebody, um, they're saying something or they mention something about a gun, they know they can call these independent nonprofit folks who can advise them, who can assess, who can do a case study, who can do some training. Um, And here, I think, you know, even when parents know something's wrong, even when friends know something's wrong, the likelihood that they know who to call, that the 
if they do call the police, that the police would be able to do anything if there isn't something illegal happening already. That there, you know, we need better ways to connect people with resources that exist. But we also have to recognize, I think, that by the time someone is way down the pipeline of being radicalized, it's very hard to bring them back. And so a lot of what I do and what my team's work does is try to focus on the preventative side. How can we prevent more people from not even encountering that material or from recognizing what it is when they see it so that they're not drawn into it? Well, listen, uh, you're a really important person doing very important work as is uh, your your research group. And this new book is excellent. Hate and the Homeland, the new global far right. Absolutely fascinating. It comes out not not until October, though. Is that right? Not until so October. Pre-order yeah. it now. Pre-order it now. And I'll talk to you again before the release date, uh, if not a few times before, because I'm, I'm super fascinated with this. And I have been Great. for years and years and years. And I'm I'm really excited to have discovered your work. Uh, Cynthia, thanks Thank so you. much for joining me. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Look forward to thanks doing it again. Thanks for having me. Great questions. I really enjoyed it. Thank thanks you. a lot. Take care. There you go. First time on the show, Dr. Cynthia Miller Idris. Definitely get that book. I learned so much preparing for the interview as well as the conversation itself. Hate in the Homeland, the new global far right available in October, like I said. Okay, now it's time to get to my next guest, my second guest of today's show, is an old friend of mine who I met when I was working at Sirius XM when her, I think, I don't know when I met her or exactly how I met her. I don't know why I don't remember, but Kelly Carlin, of course, George Carlin's daughter, uh, but is, uh, is just an amazing person who has been a, a, such a good friend to me through the, the good times and the bad. And she has a, a great book that I highly recommend that you check out. Uh, you should check out her, her podcast as well. As she mentions, she's bringing back. Uh, her book, though, is called The Carlin Home Companion, Growing Up with George. We reference it, I think, a couple times in this conversation. And you should also check out her workshops, Women on the Verge. Go to womenonthevergecoaching.com, womenonthevergecoaching.com, and definitely give her a follow on Twitter. Also, it was just announced yesterday that she is going to be co-producing a documentary about her dad, George Carlin, a uh, two-part series for HBO with Judd Apatow. And we talk about that later on in the interview as well. I'm really happy about this conversation, and I think you're going to like it. Folks loved the last time, the first time we talked here on the podcast, and I think you're going to really get a lot out of this conversation as well. By the way, her, her Twitter is at Kelly underscore Carlin. Here now, my conversation with Kelly Carlin. Oh, my gosh. It's Kelly Carlin, one of my heroes, one of my mentors, one of my uh, friends who has helped me through uh, hard times and is just uh, all around amazing human being. And it's been too long since we talked. And I was thinking, who is a person I haven't talked to since the pandemic started who would be a really good, honest, real, thoughtful person to talk to? And I thought of you. and I'm so glad that you could join me today. Hi. Hello. Uh Thank you for thinking of me with all of those words attached to the image of me in your head. <laughs> and uh, yeah, how did we make it through the pandemic already without each other? I mean, that's crazy. I don't know. I mean, I don't think you need me. I need you. It's a very code. <laughs> the codependency is only one way. But so I, I, I appreciate that magnanimous uh, gesture. But uh, the question is, how have I made it through without you? But I, I haven't. I, I have made it through with you because I think often of the things that you have said and, and taught me. I follow you on social media. And I when you fall down on Twitter or anywhere and, and talk about that, it's difficult. It's so it's so humanizing for me. I'm like, oh, because I have you on such a pedestal. That when you're like, when you say something about like, this is crazy, how how are we, you know, that you're struggling. I'm like, oh, she's struggling. Good. Uh, then then I'm OK. God, you know, that's so funny because in my head, I am like. You know, I've always kind of seen myself as the as the non-functioning one in my family, because, you know, when you have high achievers in your family, the bar is really high. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate that, but I really, 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 really believe like my whole world, everything I do in it, whether it's be with loved ones and hanging out or 
on any kind of communication device or or portal, whether it's a podcast or social media or with my clients even. Um, <clears throat> and my writing, of course, my writing is very much about being human. My whole thing, like I remember... 30 years ago, seeing Spalding Gray for the first time, who was a famous monologist. Um, he did Swimming to Cambodia and Monster in a Box. And I remember seeing this storyteller monologist on stage at UCLA. He came through our theater there. <clears throat> and he just like unzipped himself and poured his neuroses all over the stage. And I was like, oh my God, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to do that because it had the the power in the spectacle of theater, which was my dad's realm, being on a stage and being the solo person on the stage. But unlike my dad, who was all very much in his head with ideas and observations, but not a lot of emotions and revealing of the personal, right. zero revealing of the personal, right. I was like, oh, look, this man is like telling us he's crazy and he's telling us the story and he's here today. So he must be OK on some level, even though he ended up committing suicide in the end. Um, and so I've just always, always wanted to be the person who's like admits that shit's going down or I feel crazy today or. Or I figured something out. You want to hear it like that kind of. Yeah, stuff. well, I like I like that you're so. Uh, tra tr transparent and honest and vulnerable because in the moments where you might be sharing a struggle, I follow Kelly Carlin to the next moment. Mm -hmm. See, I see how you get out of it and I follow that. I mean, I don't always see, it's not like you're always exposing every solution, but I know that there is a next moment that you do move forward, that there is a destination point. And so I wait for that. I look for that, knowing that you're going to figure it out some way, somehow, as you've helped me do. So I feel like that's the the kind of rewarding part. It's like, OK, this person fell down, but this person always seems to find a way to get back up. So I can, too. Does that make sense? I, I don't know. If, yes. Yeah. Yes. And we are scrappy people, all of us, because let's remember we're here because every single one of our fucking ancestors survived. So we come from scrappy, resilient people. We would not be here if some of our ancestors had not survived the Spanish flu, or if you want to call it the Nebraska flu. Um, <laughs> you know, they survived the freaking <laughs> plague. They yeah. survived the crusades. They survived the potato famine. They survived um, the Holocaust. The Holocaust, right? And and every Holocaust before that, right? Because there was certainly plenty of them. Yeah. If you read your history. Um, so I, I, I like I do. I really have been like lately been standing on the shoulders of my ancestors, like really remembering we are a resilient species. We will get through this. Not everyone, not all of us, but the majority of us will. And um, we will do that by finding our strength and courage and fortitude in, in places that we never thought we had it. I like that you just said not all of us, because some of us won't. Some of us will no. get sick and die and we'll all die. Uh, but but the idea of I was thinking about it today. I'm in a really good place today. And mm -hmm. I was like, if only there wasn't this pandemic that I have to worry about and it's so life changing, then things would be that much better. I hope I get through it and I hope it changes because then you know, if if I survive, if my loved ones, you know, survive through this, then I'll, I'll but you don't know. And that's the uncertainty uh, is, is what's killing, not literally, but what's what's so difficult. Am I right? Isn't it the uncertainty that is the most yeah. challenging thing about this or maybe life in general? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you and I've talked about it, that uh, that little pesky part of us, the ego. Hmm. Yeah, that part of our personality, the one that wants to be in control of everything yes. and know all the answers and and have someone say, oh, you know what? If you do this, for sure, this will happen. Like it wants it wants, um, you know. It, it wants certain it, it, 
it lives for certainty. That's its whole job because with certainty, it can be like, all right, then I can, uh, you know, th- then I can relax and I can focus on my stuff. But I think, you know, one of the things that really, so, I mean, so much is unpacked for me. I actually started doing my podcast again because I'm like, I've got a lot of shit to great, say now. Great, about great, great. I know. I'm excited. Well, uh, how do people um, find that? Just search your name. We're podcasts or uh, waking from the American dream. Awesome. Is the name of it. And, and I'll I put a like link a, to it in the show notes too. I'm just trying to find something oh, to write yeah. with. Yep. There's like 140 some odd, uh, you know, episodes from the archives and stuff, but I just started up on it again. But one of the things I was thinking about at the beginning of the pandemic around this uncertainty thing, because you're so right, Pete, I mean, it's all about the terror of the uncertainty. And see, that's also when the brain starts to like fill in the gaps, like, okay, so we don't know what's going to happen. So I'm going to start scenario making for you so that you can be <laughs> ready for any possible scenario. Right, right. So let's just, and, it, and then it just starts fucking churning out scenarios And you're like in the future, nine months down the road, and there's, you know, it's Mad Max, you know, or something. (laughs) I mean, yes, that I think that's happening. Like we, it used to happen maybe once a week or a month to some of us. And I think to those people, it's happening pretty regularly getting to, you know, climate change plus pandemic plus end of democracy. You're pretty close to some dystopian film or another. For sure. And then like, you know, the narcissistic uh, strongman leader. I mean, yeah, it's all. So we've all seen the movies of it and our psyches have been working out the movies of it. But here's my thought, like just from an existential level, even though it feels like we're on the brink more and that there's that everything is in flux. I'm just here to say that even before the pandemic, even before the strange man in the White House, um, even before infrastructure or institutions were being questioned and the foundations of them were being, that there was the same amount of uncertainty in life then than there is today. It's the same amount. It's just that we can see it more now. I, and there- yeah, y- yes, we can see it more now. And when I lost my job and was devastated and and I'll never forget that call that I made to you and we talked about it a, a lot in an earlier episode of this podcast. I'll have to link to that one as well. And, and, um, and by the way, that time everybody was like, was people were blown away by our conversation. And I remember saying, well, I've got to have Kelly on as often as she can, she can join me. It's been way too long. So as often as you can join me, we should, I, I should make more of an effort. But the point is I had so much uncertainty and you gave me this metaphor about it being a ship at sea and that I can't see land but it's there and i'll get there and i could not accept that then i knew you were right but i couldn't see that i couldn't deal but learning that resilience and having that uncertainty then prepared me for this now and i fear that some people were like me and that they had a certain uh, amount of privilege in their life and never had been dealt such a difficult card and and they're yeah. having a a, a a harder struggle now with this uncertainty. And then there's other people like you or my wife or, or, or who know a lot more that have all these different resources. But I do feel there's a whole bunch of people that this is brand new for. I'm glad I was prepared a little bit just before it happened with the loss of my job. Yeah. And and that's so and now fair. everybody's lost their job. Yeah. And and, you know, and and I, you know, I remember you know, I mean, like, like you said, you know, we have a certain amount of privilege and I have certainly had a hell of a fucking lot of privilege in my own life. Um, But thinking back in different times in my life, relative to my own levels of certainty and who am I and what I know where I'm going or what's next, you know, really like letting myself go back into my past and realize there are a lot of times, you know, it wasn't a pandemic. Okay. Um, but there were plenty of times in my life when it felt like the, the kind of the earth opened up and I fell into it. And like one of the biggest ones was my mother died when I was 34. She got sick and very quickly within six weeks she was dead. And that feels like the earth kind of opening up. It's the same amount of like, who am I and what's going on and what's up and what's down and what's real and what's not. And what do I believe in and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of, um, confusion about meaning and safety and 
how can one person be here and then six weeks later them not be mm. here? I mean, all that kind of stuff. And there I'm betting everyone, I mean, none of us have faced this level of uncertainty consciously, consciously faced this level of uncertainty. Pandemic is big. We have gotten through our country and as a people, we have gotten through really, really scary, difficult times before. And the Depression, the Spanish flu, World War I, the Depression, and World War II were, are a good span of time to think about that. And uh, we made it through. And we were lucky that some leadership stepped forward, hoping that happens to some leadership. It is a different time, though. Well, yeah, but I mean, um, I would only say, not to push back, but we – didn't make it through what you're saying. Your point you're saying is humanity or Americans made it through, but you know, we didn't make it through part of the problem that some people have identified. Uh, Jared Yates Sexton is talking about this a lot is that we, we believe that we are exceptional American exceptionalism. There's never been more evidence than the fact that the United States elected a madman and we have the highest oh, numbers. Yeah. Like we haven't right. been through this and 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 in this case our, it's different because we we can't like i can't hug you i can't right. can't comfort you right. in the ways be with you in the ways that i'm i normally would uh, yes and but we as a species humans we have made it through that's why i said the whole thing about the ancestors earlier right. and that there there is a way to make it through this we and like we already said, some portion of us will make it through this. I think it's really important to, it's really interesting. The whole uncertainty thing, you know, from like a Buddhist, Zen Buddhist perspective, and that's what I was kind of going to go towards, is that even before all of this, waking up every day, you know, all we have is this present moment. We really, really don't know what's coming next. You could get a phone call about something. Your loved one could get sick. There could be an earthquake or a tornado. Um, you know, you could die in a car crash. Uh, you know, the North Koreans could decide to lob a fucking missile at us. I mean, who knows, right, what our afternoon is going to be like. We wake up in the morning. So all we have is what we have. And to trust that, yeah, there really is anything is possible. Anything can happen. The question is, is do you only want to go down the road of, yes, anything can happen, and it's all dark Mad Max version? <laughs> Or anything can happen. And things that we can't even think about or perceive uh, can happen that will actually bring uh, us back together, uh, bring uh, an intelligence back to modern discourse, uh, bring a leader forward who can help us point the way towards the direction we ultimately want to go. We just don't know. And so I try to live with uncertainty. It's not so much of like a terror of like, oh shit, what's going to happen next? But, oh goody, what could happen next? Like possibility. I love it. Because it's it's still the same realm as possibility. And even more so now, because since the infrastructure and the institutions and the kind of the rules that we used to play by that, by the way, since the 60s, we've been trying to break all of these rules and say, you know, why does it have to be this way? Why can't we talk about sex? And why can't we have equality? And why can't we um, be spiritual but not religious? Or why can't we have health that's really healthy uh, you know there's like all these things we've been why trying why can't to i have sex with mostly women but some guys yes exactly um whatever it is you know why can't why do i feel like i'm not uh, you know my body's not my you know like i i, I was born a girl but i feel right, like i'm a, a boy. good one yeah you know, yeah yeah all these things like the, you know and so it feels for the ego who wants to know the rules and wants to know the path and wants to have the checklist. What do I need to do today? Tell me, please. Um, it's kind of like uh, all bets are off now. And it's terrifying on some level. And yet it's also, it's the stuff that where innovation and creativity and generativity 
and leaps of of thinking and leaps of systems and leaps of organizing and leaps of networks. It's a place where all of that gets to happen too. Yes. Are we going to go through a little bit of a shit show here? I'm thinking so. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, I'm trying to think of examples as you're talking. And I I think I finally did think of one, which is the Black Lives Matter movement. Like most people, most activists, I think in in the movement themselves, I don't want to speak for anybody. So I, I think that they've thought is why, why is it? Why has it changed now? Why has it been effective now? now? And yeah, and now? we can talk about why and, and the different reasons, you know, people are sitting at home with nothing to do. There's no sports to watch. There's no distractions. So they saw the video uh, of George Floyd being murdered. Uh, they went out in the streets. It doesn't necessarily matter who's right about the catalyst, but it does seem that the truth is that the Black Lives Matter, which had high disapproval ratings amongst the vast majority of Americans, uh, is now high approval ratings and people are really taking a deep look at, at race. I mean, all these, you know, anti-racism books are bestsellers and movies that people are watching and so on. It does seem that we have had a change of heart on race in America that would not yeah. have happened had there not been a pandemic. So my, my example of something amazing that might not have happened is that. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. I mean, there's probably I, other examples, but that's I the mean, one. I, I, just, I think about also just um, like the little things, the little sure. things of our day, like families are getting to eat meals together again. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a the really good time, one. The amount of time families have together now has, I mean, since the modern era has not existed. <laughs> yeah. Abs- it's a great and it's, it's for me, you know, having teenage daughters, it, it couldn't be more yeah. true. I would I thought we were done with a lot of the things that we were doing together and they might not be happy as excited about it as I am. But, yeah, it's you're absolutely right. That's a good one. Um, making uh, reconnecting with old friends and in my case, making a ton of new friends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mine is also one of the perks and one of I think the beauties of it is seeing how the. And of course, this is from a position of privilege, but sometimes insight comes from a position of privilege that I think is an, is an important insight because I think it needs to happen for, for everyone and everything, which is the nature of work itself in our society Yes, and our relationship to work and that we are not machines. We are human beings and that there is more to life than 40 to 60 hours of productivity. I think our whole concept of productivity is become so skewed the last, well, for sure the last hundred years, but especially since the fucking eighties, we have, we have been plugged into this globalization machine of money, making money and corporations leading everything And every industry you can think of, I cannot think of a single industry. And I grew up in the entertainment industry and my husband works in it. The entertainment industry is one of the least family, mental health friendly industries (laughs) in the world. Yeah. (laughs) And this is run by quote unquote liberals people, you know, because it's, it's actually run by corporations and it's actually run by stockholders. And when you have an economy that is set up this way, we see that work is completely disconnected from humanity. We are not just, we are not connected to our work. We are just plugging into some sort of machine. Those of us who are creatives are very lucky that we get to do the work we do, but we are always straddling this commerce versus creativity and art and always living just enough to get by you know unless you're one of the one percent of the entertainment industry who make a bazillion dollars right you know the majority of the people who are sag actors make you know what seventeen thousand dollars a year or something i I have a great example that's such a really really good point and i want to talk so much more about that how we've we've become these widgets these you know productivity machines and you can make more money to some extent because of you mentioned globalization and yeah you know you mentioned starting in the 80s i'm not sure when but that starts that seems like a great date then the internet 
And I think I was one of those one percenters in, in that I had a great job in corporate media for 14 years where the last, I don't know, eight years I was making very good money, loving what I did. But Kelly, you know what the thing that was the worst part? And I think most people can relate to this part of it. The commute. I was a creative person making great money, doing what I loved. I hated that fucking commute. I hated being in that car. Yeah. Some people might like it. When I had that, when I lost the job, I obviously lost the commute. Now I'm doing really pretty well. With the podcast, it's growing and I can see myself doing better financially than I did there and not have to go into Midtown Manhattan an hour each way and deal with all of the, the headaches and the danger of it. Frankly, yeah. I am so much happier without having to work for corporate overlords and have that commute now, yeah. even in the pandemic, than I was then. And, and then, yeah, and, I, it's such a great one little example, though. The how the commute. I truly believe that the commute is soul crushing, especially out in California, right? It is anywhere, anywhere. I mean, unless you're driving. 10 miles on a country road to go somewhere. I can't imagine well, it country, not a friend so of mine crazy. works in, in lives and works in um, Middlebury, Vermont. And she was, you know, complaining that she didn't make that much money. She worked at the college at Middlebury, but at some point during a conversation, she's like, yeah, I walk to work. I'm like, yeah. you're rich. You're rich. <laughs> yeah. And so and, much and more so time. If time is it, time, time. Yes. This is the thing about for those of us, especially those first two months who were not, frontline workers and, and you know and i bow deeply to like every time i go into my supermarket i bow so deeply to every single person who works so so one of the things that i i realized and we were talking about time and the commute being soul crushing and and you know i'm not a frontline worker and i'm not a you know, I'm not one of those people that are on the front lines. And those first two months, you know, that happened, there were like certain people who had to work, yeah. you know, and and thank God they kept our society going. So we had this incredible moment, A, of really seeing these people. Yeah, these they were people invisible were for us. Really invisible. Yeah. But the time part, the part of it, which is like I started to see and I pretty much run my own schedule. You know, I work from my home. I have clients, I zoom, I don't have to commute anywhere. I have a lot of control. But what I did see was that because the world had stopped on some level, I could then give myself permission to find my own human rhythm again around work and around time and around what are some of the things that I'm normally, at least in my head about 10 hours a day and working and moving towards that's just in a lot of ways, wasted time. It's just, you know, mind fuck time or whatever, but <laughs> how do I use my time better to serve me and find that there's a, there's a human rhythm that we have completely lost. And it's like, I'm not like assuming we're all going to go back to like agrarian lifestyles. <laughs> no, but that's what you're taught. But that is the rhythm that, that is most natural. It is. And it is. Your body moves, you, you, you're connected with nature, um, you're doing... You're noticing the time of day, you know, each time, of, parts of time of the day affect us differently than yep. where the light is, um, time of the year affects us differently, there's different energy around, yep. and, and really getting like that, in order for this capitalism to work the way it works and has worked the last 40 years, 30 years. We, we don't get to be humans. In it. it's, not, <laughs> it's not interested in humans. That's <laughs> yeah. We get to, we have to be machines. We have to be machines. Yes, we do. And I think everyone, even though it's terrifying that some people are out of work right now, I know their bodies their psyche, their mind body connection, their bodies, even though there's some anxiety and probably a lot of anxiety about work and future and all that kind of stuff, there also is some part of them that is like, oh, like I'm not having to get on the fucking train at 5 30 a.m. to get into 
to get into the city by seven, to get to the thing by eight, to da 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 da, to jam 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 jam. Because we're on a fucking adrenaline junkie ride twenty four seven. Yep. Or and- or we're on any number of drugs that help us be more productive in function. I mean, from caffeine to yep. alcohol to everything else. I mean, some yeah. of these drugs are great. I mean, they're all great in moderation. But I mean, mm-hmm. if you if you're having to take uh, some kind of drug or you're not, you know, you could probably speak to just just diet, just nutrition. You're not eating. You're not you're not eating at normal times. It's it's you're this machine that has to keep functioning to make enough money to pay the mortgage, to get the insurance, to get the kids to college, to get to retirement. And it's a yeah. fucking waste. It's all yeah. broken. I mean, think about how many Starbucks are on how many corners in how many towns? Like it's drugs. Like your drugstore is on every corner so that your, your drug, your caffeine is no, is no longer than a 10 minute walk away from you. Don't well, worry. You'll be fine. Yeah, just think about how many, not only beverages, um, uh, food, there's energy like yeah, injected energy. into it's a, it's a billion dollar industry, the energy yeah. industry. Yeah. And so our adrenals, I mean, I'm no expert about this, but just from my own personal experience. Endocrinologist, Kelly Carlin. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Just add that to my name. Our adrenals are screwed. No wonder no one is sleeping. I mean, I remember when Ayanna Huffington came out with the whole sleeping thing and everyone's like, why is she talking about sleeping? Because it is the most essential thing for mental health. Yeah. Uh, Bruce Bartlett told me, uh, do you know who Bruce Bartlett is? Great. uh, I do. Um, He's a writer. He's a like a policy uh, guy. Um, He told me the other day and it stuck with me that he takes a nap. He's like 60 something. He takes a nap every day. And I said, why? What does it do for you? And I've always uh, been an advocate for napping. Um, I think my wife sees it as a sign of weakness, but I a lot of society does. But he said it's like having two work days. Yeah. And getting back to like this problem of produ- necessarily always having to be productive. But let's say it wasn't about productivity. It's like you work all day and then you, you have no time to whatever time you have left. You can't do things you enjoy. But if you take a nap, you can. You, you just have yeah. more energy. I mean, if you go to most European, southern European countries, yeah. they all know, they all have oh, yeah. CS. It's yeah. the most civilized thing I've ever. But then they have to shut down their shop and not make money. We would never do that. Oh. God forbid, right? Right. (laughs) So for me, one of the beautiful little silver linings of this time is, I feel, an enormous invitation for us to connect to our personal rhythm. Amen. Our personal rhythm. And it's going to look different. You're going to look different than your wife or your husband. Like, I'm a napper too, but my husband is... I, you know, actually when I started dating my husband, I'm like, I'm going to have to teach you how to nap. Sorry. Uh, Because, but he comes from one of those must be industrious, must be doing things all the time. (laughs) I wish we could see Kelly marching. Yep. (laughs) Yes, I'm marching right now. Uh, But this beautiful thing where, what if we were to trust our bodies to know when it was time to create, when it was time to eat when it was time to sleep, when it was time to relate to people and be in community, uh, when it is time to jam on the project and, and really dive into it, but also know that if you do that for too long, your adrenals are going to start going crazy and you need a place, a way to sit and meditate and learn to come back to your body and slow it down again. And that's been the joy for me is really And this has always been an intuition for me, which is I think my resistance always to like the nine to five gig or the corporate gig or even the ambition game for me was always like, yeah, but it's going to hijack my time to muse and like get lost in things. You know, my dad was lucky. He was one of those creatives that made a lot of money at what he did. And he kind of like, set in his day the musing time you know like that was yeah did, did did you ever get to know or talk with him about his schedule and i always think about really successful people who do what i do or, or creatives as you call them which i love and you think about george carlin and, and it's almost like i wish i knew, what was his day like did he have a day 
Did he have um, routines? Did he do certain things at certain times? And, and, and what, if anything, did you take and what did you leave behind yourself? Yeah. So the one thing I know is that early in my life um, and up until, I mean, most of his life, he was on the road, right? He was a guy who right. would say, you know, well, you can't all come to my house, so I got to come to yours. Right. So he was a guy on the road. And at the height of his career, um, he was on the road 200 days a year. That's two thirds of your life, by the way, people to say that so once again family unfriendly family stuff you're yep. never home yep not really connected to the rhythm of our house our life and then the travel anybody who travels for work it's exciting the first month it's the thing it's, i hated about comedy and and, and, and what you just said is so dead on it was it, it when i first started traveling getting paid I walk yeah. through that airport with my chin up and my chest. I thought it was the cool. I'm getting paid. They're flying me to this college to do comedy. And then at some point I was like, I was staying at a La Quinta Inn in El Paso. My daughter had just been born. And I'm like, I'd rather be a janitor. I would and be yeah. home. Yep. Uh, that was one thing I learned when I started touring my solo show and was touring my book tour was I was on the road by myself a lot. And I said, to, and I yeah, suddenly the loneliness. Had, incredible compassion for my father mm. and incredible mm -hmm. compassion and empathy came over me. And I thought, my God, wow. Like, fuck. Now he ended up sorting his life and sorting his mind. And because he had such a busy mind, he could write anywhere he was. So he always set aside, um, if he could, a certain amount of time a day to do work, even on the road. He was that disciplined, extremely disciplined about it. Um, and at home, very disciplined about it. And then somewhere in the 80s, my mom was like, you're on the road too much. So my dad started doing like long weekends. So he could be home four days a week. But then you're gone three days, home four days, gone three days. And that's a weird rhythm, too. That's another kind of a rhythm. Hell yeah. I really believe that my dad's heart disease, because he had, he had genetic heart disease anyway, but I really believe that his heart disease was exacerbated by the stress of that kind had, of had to be pace of life. Absolutely. And, and he could never, and he was just wired. So he could never really rest. You know, he could take naps before a show. He could sleep, but he was also a guy who was always, you know, his leg was always going tap, 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 tap. And his mind was always going. And, and I tried to teach him mindfulness meditation. And he would say to me, oh, I would just wish I could learn how to do this. And I'm like, I wish you could too, dad. Um, so I, I think a part of me saw all of that and saw the price on my family and my mom and dad's relationship. I saw the price on his body. And I think a part of me did reject it for that. It was like, you know what, even if I, if, if I do have some ambition, I need to make sure that I don't kill myself. Well, I'm so glad you said, I was just about to ask, go back to ambition and you just said it again. And I think I want to connect the, the ambition that we have and we can define, you know, what that is for, you know, success, money, uh, achievement, achievement, reputation. But yeah. I actually think that one really, we, we measure success completely wrong, obviously, but I think one way to measure it might be how you're talking about the, what did you call it? The human rhythm. Like if you can successfully get into a healthy rhythm of eating and exercising and meditating and doing the things that you enjoy versus just the work that yeah. makes the money to pay the bills, what an ambition that would be. But that doesn't come with the, especially in our country and our culture, all the ego yeah. along with it. If I'm not the most successful comedian or broadcast or whatever I'm doing, in my field, banker, whatever it is, then I'm no good. Yeah. It's as a and person. And so many of us have the core belief, the I'm not worthy. I'm no good already. Like that's kind of a, kind of a built in. I get it a lot from most of my clients and yeah. I've certainly had it. And it's this very conversation is something very personal to me too, because one of the things I have wrestled with the last five years <clears throat> and I'd wrestled with it before, but I felt it was kind of, I always felt I was, I was an extremely ambitious person my whole life, but always um, didn't, 
felt very lost and didn't know how to go about it and didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and a lot of that had to do with being in the shadow of my dad. Yeah, of course. hundred yeah. percent. Um, but my bar for ambition was always so high. And I remember doing an art piece and it said something like, um, it's so sad that, um, I believe that unless 10,000 people are chanting my name, what I've done is pretty much worthless. Well, I mean, that's that's before social media. Yeah, that's before so social that's, media. If if I don't get enough likes or retweets, yeah. right. I'm worthless. I'm worthless. It's such like a, it's such a concrete measure of mm-hmm. your um whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And and so I re- so then my dad died and I had this permission from the world to like step into the spotlight Mm -hmm. and to find myself in that spotlight. I found myself part of the entertainment industry. So all of a sudden, especially part of the comedy world, Paul Provenza brought me in. I did the green room. I did my solo show with him. Serious XM. I I wrote a book, you know, and and my book came out five years ago. And after my book came out, and I'm sure you've had this experience too, where you kind of, I mean, I'd realized that I'd been working on some level or another for 15 years for that book to come out. Like in some way or another, I was always, my story was always right here, Hmm. chiding me on, go, go, go. You need to make me, you need to make me, you need to share me. And then I did my solo show and then the book came out and then it was done this big ambition I'd had, this big thing I'd had. And I got some notoriety from it, lovely. And I got some Twitter followers and I got some lovely, I mean, I get lovely emails, which is the most important thing for me from readers and things like that. But what happened was, it was then like, okay, now what? Now what? Now who do I want to be? What do I want to be now? And my bar was still so high. And I just found that, the, especially the last three years, that I've had to come really face to face with myself to really decide what is my ambition and what's more important than my ambition. And what if I do stay invisible the rest of my life, but I get to be in my own human rhythm. I get to do some powerful, deep work with a certain amount of people every year. Uh, I get to go on some friends podcasts and and speak to a larger audience or do my podcast or my Sirius XM show or every once in a while get to do a George Carlin thing and connect with his fans. Can I live with that? Is that enough for me? And, um, and it's like what I've really found during the pandemic is like, I want to protect my ability to be connected to my human rhythm much more now than any dream I ever had of being like the Oprah who says fuck. Um, first of all, a Carlin home companion is an amazing book growing up with George by Kelly Carlin. It's so good and it will always be relevant and everybody should, should get it right now. And second of all, what an amazing discovery. And I guess I just want to have a, a, a compare it to, um, an elite athlete who's a marathoner uh, and they run a marathon. Now what? Well, another marathon or an ultra, you know, these people that run like hundred miles or a climber climbing mountains, but it, it doesn't, but, but what you're saying is it doesn't have to be a marathon. It could yeah. now be composing a piece of music or, yeah. or, or just getting in the right space, changing your dreams. Uh, um, um, well, and it's and it's not even changing it. It's really seeing and getting clear on what is it you really want. Scientology, the- I think, is what you said. Yeah. Getting clear. <laughs> yes. That's put it's. A, I want to be a Scientologist. That's put a can of soup up to your ear, or whatever they do. I don't know what they do there. Um, but it's about <laughs> what is really fulfillment. What yes. is really the fulfillment? Is me being famous like my dad, what is, what do I think that's going to get me? And really, every time I get close to the spotlight or the amount of intensity of attention that he got, yeah. it is horrible. <laughs> I just am here to tell Why? you people. It's horrible. I'm an empath, first of all. I'm a right. person who feels like 
it's it you empaths out there understand what i'm saying it's not woo woo it's a thing you f- you feel connected to everything and so when i have a lot of people staring at me my body kind of like is like it's too much to metabolize there's mm. like too much electrons coming at me or something like that it's why public speaking is terrifying for people having eyeballs on you is a very intense experience unless you're very well protected and your own little bubble and all that kind of stuff, which most celebrities are. Yeah. But the problem, the problem with it, and I, uh, you weren't going, I thought you were going in this direction, but you weren't, um, is that all those eyeballs, I just did stand up live for the first time in, since March. And I forgot like that high and that power and that control. And, but it was really interesting to not have it for so long I yep. think I'm over it now. I know I'm over it now. I'm 44. I don't I don't need that anymore. But it's I, I can identify it and I can see it and say, oh, hello, old friend. But there's then a thirst for more. I thought that's what you were getting at, but it wasn't. But like it's never enough fame. It's yeah. never enough celebrity. It's never enough for people who can't relate to that money. And yeah, and it's never enough cocaine. There's never right. enough cocaine, Pete. <laughs> yeah, whatever it you is, know, whatever your thing is that you think is going to feed you, it's never enough. Right. And being on stage, I mean, I, I get you, babe. I've been, on, I know what it's like to be yeah. on stage, to be in the spotlight, to be in control of your craft, interchanging that energy with a live energy, with a live audience is incredible. And uh, it's not everything. At, at some point you have to get off the stage. At some point you have to come down from the high. You have to relate back to your kids and your wife and your life and take out the trash and be a human again too it's it's a very and, weird experience being with all those eyeballs and if you me- yeah and if you measure things by that they will mislead you because do you know how few fucks my daughters give about yeah. my my success my yeah. they just i guess the blue check next to your name is cool if you're a kid but other than that like they it's not like they like, I will constantly yell, especially at my younger one. I scream at her. Maybe this is bad parenting. Do you know who I am? Doesn't <laughs> doesn't care. I, I told her. I was like, yeah, I was on CNN and MSNBC on the same day. Yeah, Wh- whatever, dad, whatever. Uh-uh. Doesn't care. No, it's all it's all bullshit. It's complete um, bullshit. I mean, no one knows that more than you. Let me ask yeah. you about um, sp- your specific work, Women on the Verge. You're doing these. You're continuing to do these workshops. And I also want to just make sure I have time to ask you about the, the documentary. It just got announced. But um, talk to me about Women on the Verge. What is it? Who should be um, who, who, who does it help? Who, who would be interested in doing this with you? So Women on the Verge is a year long program. It's a coaching program. It's a community of, of other women. Uh, and it's for women who have come to a crossroads in their life whether it's an external experience of, oh, uh, empty nest syndrome or changing career or <laughs> haha, pandemic. Um, but you know, you're like at a place that something's not working for you anymore. It can also be like an internal, like, oh, meaning I'm looking for meaning or legacy or impact. What's the impact I want to have in the life. So, and that's the verge part. It's like, you know, or you feel like you're always on the verge as a creative, like I always like, oh, I'm just, and not the verge of success, but the verge of personal expression. Like, how do I express myself in a more authentic, empowered way? And those are all a bunch of kind of workshoppy words I know, and I apologize for them, but um, they're kind of the best ones I have. And they work. And I like a it. Lo- and a, a lot of what I do with women and a lot of the, what I'm kind of dedicated to doing is to teach women to stop listening to the external voices of the culture and their family who tell them who they're supposed to be. Because I know this happens for men too, but for women, it happens in a very particular way. From day one, you are told how you are to be of service to everyone else and everything else. And that is a natural inclination of women is to be of service and to caretake. It's how we're hardwired. And it is a beautiful thing that we have hardwired into us. But if it's not aligned with what actually feeds us, it is uh, an emptying, deadening um, cul-de-sac in the end. And so a lot of the work I do is I help women really get connected to themselves, their own human rhythm, their own rhythm from based on being 
uh, connected to the feminine with a capital F and, and also connecting to inner aspects of themselves that are here to be their, their allies, their support team, um, you know, not just the voices in their head that telling them they're not thin enough or not rich enough or not giving enough, um, you know, really connecting them to self-worth. Um, so I focus on teaching them how to turn towards themselves, teaching them how to renegotiate with the voices in their head and the people in their lives. I teach them about the real act of self-love, which is consistently doing what is your heart's desire. And then I help them create the impact that they want to have in the world. What do they want to do in the world? Whether it's creative expression or being a leader of a company or an organization or just a family. Does, you don't have to run for president to be a leader. Um, what's the impact you want to have? And how does that align with your natural way of being in the world? So it's really about discarding all the bullshit and getting maybe for the first time back to who you really, really were meant to be. That's great. Women on the verge coaching.com. Is it the website? I'm just yeah. looking it up here. If, yep. if anybody wants to uh, reach out to Kelly and, and sign up for that, that's uh, so and it's well. Been, it's been incredible. I've been doing it for two years now. I have about 25. I, I, I'm very particular about who I let in, but now this community has grown. I have about 25 women who are consistently there. I have women who are coming into a second year and it's just this beautiful space where women um, support each other, cheer each other on, also are vulnerable, reveal what's hard for them, what's impossible, what's scary. And um, it's just been an absolute total privilege and honor to it, do this work. Uh, and I'm sure extremely rewarding. Do you, is it mostly one on one or is it group? It's uh, it's group and one on one. Yeah. Oh, good. Because I think they're both have their benefits, they're both, but they're both, they I've both been have their building benefits. this community with the podcast and we do these zoom hangouts and, and I have no idea what I'm doing. Like there's no curriculum or structure. I don't know. You know, I'm not like you, I don't know it, like what to say or advice to get, but, but I do know that people just like, especially now during this time connecting and yep. when they have a kindred spirit of, of sorts, they're curious, they're passionate, they're kind, they're, they're often hilarious people. Um, generous it's uh, extremely rewarding to be in that kind of, especially without connection. So that must be amazing for yeah. all of your uh, uh, clients to be able to be there and be with you. Now, before I uh, have to let you go, of course, um, and we've been talking for almost an hour and I'm so happy and I feel so good talking to you. And I'm sure people do listening to this conversation. There was a press release today. Was it today, today. about this new documentary that you are working on with the great Judd Apatow uh, about it's a two part documentary. It's going to be on HBO um, about George Carlin. And it's super exciting. And I'm sure a lot of people have wanted to do this for a long time, but you probably wanted to make sure if it's done, it's done right. So why now? Why Judd Apatow? Why HBO? What is it? What can we what can you tell us? This is just announced. Well, um, why HBO? Well, because HBO and my father changed television. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a great answer. But maybe HBO's, you know, different now. I don't know. I mean, well, I guess, I, do I you mean, feel like you owe is, them? Part of it is, is that, of course, Judd did the Gary Shandling documentary with right. them. And we loved that. Yeah. And so Judd's got a connection with them. We have a connection with them. Really, if it was going to go anywhere else, it'd be like, eh, really? So, yay, it's at HBO. Uh, Judd, because Judd ticks all the boxes. Right. Uh, so great. Huge fan of my father's really sees and understands that my father's, what he said is as relevant today, maybe even more so than it was when he said it 12, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, if any of one out there saw the big kind of, Thing that happened two weeks ago, which is yeah. I want to ask the, ask you about that. What what happened? So what happened was I woke up and uh, you know I didn't check my phone right away, but I, when I did finally check my phone, I checked Twitter and someone had DM'd me and said, "Oh, have you seen this?" And I saw the routine it was based on, and I'm like, "Well, yeah, I I've seen my father's routine about the owners of America." Didn't didn't click went over to search to kind of see what the trending topics were. Oh, George Carlin's trending. <laughs> oh, okay. What the hell's going on? Yeah. 
went to my feed, saw this video that had gone viral. At that point, it only had been seen by about a million and a half people. I don't know how many people now. I think it's like up to 7 million people now. Uh, And I started scrolling through the comments and stuff and saw how everyone was claiming him for their position. And as the daughter of my very amazing, talented father, um, it just really drives me crazy when people want to try to put him in their pocket. Yeah. And I wasn't upset with the people who made the video. I actually thought the video was really, really well done. I was like, wow, if I could have taken this piece and found some images to go with it, um, I may have broadened the images a little bit, but for the most part, thumbs up, spot on. Mm. And I just, I had to send out a few tweets which I don't, I don't like doing. I don't like getting in the middle of it. I don't like having to explain my father. And ultimately, I can't explain my father. Who he would be today, 12 years in, after his death and this Trump era and everything, my father would obviously have a take that I can't come up with because I'm not George Carlin. But here's what I do know. He hated people like Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the pinnacle of the human being that he hated the most in America. Privileged, white, businessman. And especially one as corrupt and as racist. My father hated racism. From day one, me coming out of the womb, that is the biggest message I got from my father, was about how this country fucked brown people and fucked them every single day. Mm. So, you know, all of that is great. Uh, Would my dad necessarily sign up to be used in such a partisan way? Probably not. But it feels like these times are pretty precarious. And if we don't get this motherfucker out of the White House, I believe this experiment, even though my father believed this experiment was over 30 years ago, I believe now that this experiment is would be really over, this democracy, this thing called the American democracy is over. So I was okay with it. And I explained a couple of things to some fans. I replied to a few people and then I muted the conversations mm. because I can't, I cannot spend my life doing that. Um, So that happened two weeks ago and I knew we were going to make this announcement. So I knew that, and I don't, you know, plus I had to school a bunch of people on my feed, like, please don't send me George Carlin videos now. As we know, we, you and I've had this conversation before. I'm a separate person. I don't do George Carlin all day long. And I have the privilege to mention him when I want. He's my dad. Um, But I'm excited to talk about the documentary because the documentary is going to be amazing. It's going to be a two-parter. It's Judd and his producing team. It's Teddy Leifer from Rise Films. They did this amazing documentary. Please, everyone go watch Icarus. It won the Oscar three years ago. It's about doping in in, um, athletes. Oh, right, right, right. Never watched it. Oh my God, Pete, it's, you think it's going one way and this thing goes another way. I have way. heard people rave about that. And then it's an incredible documentary. Okay. I'm watching. And Teddy came to me about two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago, pitching a George Carlin doc. It took this long to just put all the pieces in the right place for many, many reasons. Um, but I could not be more excited to be doing this with Teddy, um, who's also an executive producer with Judd's team and uh, Judd's co-director, Mike. Um, And, um, you know, it's exciting, even though it's a pandemic and it's going to be weird and they're going to have to shoot things and everything. But I'm super excited that my dad's story is going to be told in this way. And by someone like Judd, who is, I think, one of the preeminent storytellers of our time. Yeah, he did such a good job with the George, uh, the uh, Gary Shandling. um, He really did. The thing I love about... Judd is that he has really, really high EQ. He's got a lot oh, of yeah, emotional yeah. intelligence. Great point. Yeah, he's he's and and he's a very down to earth, kind person to to like everybody. Yep. Um, yeah, he's a good egg. He's a yeah. really good egg. And um, and you know, dad like you know, my dad hated the business and all the bullshit and everything. Mm-hmm. But my dad did like when the right prestige or acclaim came along and i think it's really great that judd apatow is doing this i think it's did he the right know did judd know your dad oh uh, they met sure yeah, yeah. they met they their 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 paths had crossed along right. the way so yeah uh that's awesome that's so exciting and a great place to end to be excited about that and um check out all the links for all everything uh, kelly's doing on the show notes here 
And it's been too long and I hope it's not nearly this long and I will have you on whenever you want to join me because I just, I feel so good when I talk to you. It's so real. It's so inspiring and it's so, uh, it's so good. Thank you. I I always love being here, Pete. It's always, I know we're always going to have a fun, good back and forth and it's always so, it's really fulfilling for me. Last night you sent out a tweet saying that you were excited to talk to me and it fucking made my life. I was over the moon that you would say, I'm looking forward to this. Nobody, you know, people don't usually do that. And it made me feel so good because I was so looking forward to it as well. And um, I'm, I'm sad it's over. Let's do it again really soon. Thank you for talking to me today. I would love to come back soon. And uh, yay. Yay team. Yeah. Kelly Carlin, did you hear the wind chimes during her side of the conversation? And can you hear the crickets, the cicadas as I'm recording now? Can you? Let me go put this by the window. Okay, I'm sure you have some at your house. I don't know why I had to do that, but maybe you live in the city or something and you just want to hear some sounds of nature. That's all I've got for today's show. And thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe on Patreon, patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. We've got to get to 700 subscribers. We're getting very close. And the big goal is 3,000, which I know that we can do. So tell your friends, give the show a rating, and I'm going to be doing all kinds of exciting new promotions. But first things first got to get that shedio built the studio outside so i can finally be comfortable and uh and do a lot a lot more capabilities for the podcast as well okay that's it for today i'll talk to you tomorrow and know that you're not alone sign up for a subscription hang out with us on the zoom hangouts which i should probably do one this week maybe we'll do one maybe again thursday thursday or friday which do you prefer if you're still listening let me know email me stand up with pete at gmail.com also what is the platform we should be building our community on let me know if you have ideas for that with an email with the subject stand up community you're not alone i love you i'll talk to you tomorrow